This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please join me as we come together to worship our Lord. Servants of God, praise. Praise the Lord. Bless the Lord's name now and always. Praise the Lord's name. We praise you, Lord, for creating this world in all her beauty. For the world through Christ our Lord. And for sending us the gift of your spirit. We long for your spirit to work among us now. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is number 228, I Will Sing of My Redeemer. If you're comfortable standing and feel like doing so, you're welcome to. reading this morning comes from Psalm 67. 
May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us. So let your ways be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing your joy. For you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. The land yields its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. May God bless us still, so that all the ends of the earth will hear your We cannot come before God in worship unless our, we are first honest with ourselves about who we are, about the mistakes we make, and about how well or poorly we care for others. In this spirit, let us offer our prayers to God. Holy and merciful God, in your presence we confess our sinfulness, our shortcomings, and our offenses against you. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. Have mercy on us, O Lord, for we are ashamed and sorry for all we have done to displease you. Forgive our sins and help us to live in your light and walk in your ways for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. <laughs> forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. In Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the richness of his grace. Know you are forgiven and be at peace. Thanks be to God. Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and he is seated on the right hand of God the Father. He will come living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Our next hymn is number 35, Near to the Heart of God.
we prepare to hear the reading of the Holy Word of God, let us pray for illumination together. Holy Spirit, pour out upon us wisdom and understanding that being taught by you in Holy Scripture, our hearts and minds may be open to receive all that leads to life and holiness through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Scripture readings this morning come from the letter of Paul to Timothy, the second letter, um, and that's from chapter 2, verses 1 through 26, and from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, verses 25 through 29. Hear the word of our Lord. You then, my child, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me through many witnesses and trust to faithful people who will be able to teach others as well. Share in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving in the army gets entangled in everyday affairs. The soldier's aim is to please the enlisting officer. And in the case of an athlete, no one is crowned without competing according to the rules. It is the farmer who does the work who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding of all things. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, a descendant of David, that is my gospel, for which I suffer hardship, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But the word of God is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of of the elect, so that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is sure. If we have died for him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Remind them of this and warn them before God that they are to avoid wrangling over words, which does no good, but only ruins those who are listening. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved by him, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly explaining the word of truth. Avoid profane chatter, for it will lead people into more and more impiety and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth by claiming that the resurrection has already taken place. They are upsetting the faith of some. But God's firm foundation stands, bearing this inscription, the Lord knows who are his, and let everyone who calls on his, the name of the Lord turn away from wickedness. In a large house there are utensils, not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some for special service, for special use, some for ordinary. All who cleanse themselves of the things I have mentioned will, be some special, will become special utensils, dedicated and useful to the owner of the house ready for every good work. Shun youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with stupid and senseless, senseless controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kindly to everyone. An apt teacher, patient, correcting opponents with gentleness, God may perhaps grant that they will repent and come to know the truth, and that they may escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. In the reading from Matthew, at that time Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father. For such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by the Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, 
and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Proverbs tells us that wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out seven pillars. And James says that the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, then gentle. This week we're exploring the gentleness that helps to build our house of wisdom. And as I studied about this pillar of gentleness carved by wisdom to support the house that she has built, and in supporting the house that we're attempting to build, God led me to this letter written by Paul to his dear adopted son in faith, Timothy. It's a pastoral epistle. Paul wrote it because Timothy was starting his ministry and Paul had instruction for Timothy to follow. How to teach the good news to others to share it with still others. Paul's gospel says, this is the good news, and it's simple. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel. Simply that Christ was born a man of royal lineage, that Christ died and was resurrected. The simplicity of Paul's good news in God's promises in the first covenant were fulfilled by Jesus to bring us to resurrected life in God's eternal kingdom. But as I studied this portion of Paul's letter to Timothy, at first I was confused. I was looking for gentleness. But this text starts out by talking about soldiers. In my mind, I pictured Roman soldiers using force against the Christians brute strength, or maybe a modern day war movie where soldiers are charging a hill and taking by force the enemies that they're fighting. Now, as I thought about it more, I certainly know some very gentle soldiers. So it's not true of all. And Paul goes on to explain, as I kept reading, that these are soldiers in God's army. So of course they would be different from the soldiers that I might picture based on my current day perception of what a soldier is. The images of death and destruction that come. But Paul says that we can't stop at our initial reaction to something. We need to explore deeper, to broaden our understanding so that our preconceived notions aren't what we bring to the Word of God. These are soldiers serving in the army of Jesus Christ under his command. And Paul says, no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. I have not ever served in the armed forces, and I give thanks to all of those many in this room and others that have. But I do understand that when an order is given, 
by a commanding officer. It's obeyed by a soldier. They don't argue. They follow. So maybe I don't have the right perception of a soldier. Paul knows that not everyone has the same frame of reference. And so he goes on to also explain that an athlete must follow the rules as he runs a race or competes for an Olympic medal. There are rules to follow, just as there are commands to follow. We don't win if we cheat and don't follow the rules. A farmer is also under the command of the seasons, the soil, the intensive labor that goes into producing and harvesting a crop. Understanding the call to follow Christ, to be a good soldier in God's army, a runner of a good race, a sower of seeds means knowing what Christ is calling us to. What are his commands? What are the rules, the conditions under which we're working? Well, God's word is the first place to look. And Jesus said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Jesus said, Come to me. For I am gentle and humble. This is our commander-in-chief, meek and gentle. By today's understanding of those words, by today's standards, would we follow such a commander, someone who is meek and humble, gentle? It doesn't sound like a commander-in-chief to me. But he is our commander. And our modern day American English interpretation of certain words like meek aren't what was intended in God's word. And so we have to dig deeper. If I think of meekness, I think of someone who's overly submissive, a milk toast kind of person, a yes man. But in the Greek culture of the time, that was not true. The word for meek or gentle is prouds. Ignatius, the bishop of Antioch, lived in the first century, was an early follower of Christ and a native speaker of the Greek language of the New Testament. He understood the true meaning of the word prouds, which we interpret as meek or gentle. Ignatius wrote a letter to the Ephesians about 50 years after this letter from Paul to Timothy. Ignatius was on his way to Rome to face martyrdom for his beliefs. He was a follower of Christ. Now Paul had planted the church in Ephesians, in, in Ephesus, and spent several years there teaching them. Ignatius still had words of wisdom to share with them. He wrote to the church about their response to those who were persecuting followers of Christ like himself. This is part of what Ignatius wrote concerning gentleness, humility, and non-retaliation towards the enemies of the church. He said, in response to their anger, be gentle. There's that word, prowess. In response to their boasts, be humble. In response to their slander, offer prayers. In response to their errors, be steadfast in the faith. In response to their cruelty, be civilized. Ignatius followed the example of Jesus, the meekest human being to ever walk the earth. When the Jewish scholars were angry at Jesus for allowing his apostles to work on the Sabbath, he responded with a gentle explanation. 
When they boasted of their knowledge of Holy Scripture, he humbly explained the prophesied coming of the Messiah. Jesus demonstrated his gentleness, his meekness, as he washed the feet of his disciples on the night of his betrayal, including the feet of Judas, his betrayer. When the Roman soldiers crucified Jesus and raised his cross on the hill at Golgotha alongside criminals, and they drew lots for his clothing, he offered prayers for them. He told his apostle Peter to put away his sword in the Garden of Gethsemane. Instead of asking his disciples to defend him from the hands of his enemies, Christ shows an incredible act of strength under control as he commands Peter to put away his sword and then heals the ear of the wounded soldier. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is strength under control. But where do we get this type of self-control and desire to be gentle toward all people? To obey what, what Paul said to Timothy. When he said, remind them of this and warn them before God that they are to avoid wrangling over words. Some of us love to do that, don't we? Wrangle over words. It was talking about my dad earlier, and he was a great debater. He loved wrangling over words. Not out of meanness. And the older he got, the more gentle he got with years. But he liked wrangling over words. Paul also said, have nothing to do with stupid and senseless controversies, which I would say my dad didn't argue over. But if he had a point, he would gently explain his side. And then listen to his brother, who had very differing points of view. And yes, they had discussion, but they ended it with gentleness, with kind words. They didn't wrangle over stupid and senseless controversies and breed quarrels amongst themselves. Pure gentleness comes from God. God, who is gentle and humble in heart, who gives rest to the weary, who eases our burden and lightens our load. We have read in the Old Testament book of First Kings about how God approached the prophet Elijah when Elijah did not know where to turn or what to do. The Lord said to the distraught prophet, Go out and stand on the mountain. I want you to see me when I pass by. There was a strong wind that shook the mountain and shattered the rocks. Next there was an earthquake. And then there was a fire. But the Lord was not in any of these loud, destructive attention getters. Finally, there was a gentle breeze. And when Elijah heard it, he covered his face with his coat, for he knew it was God. It is in God's gentleness that we see God's mighty strength under control. Made in God's image, we are called to gentleness. Our strength is under God's control. As followers of Christ, we are blessed in our meekness in our ability to be gentle in our interactions with others. To build on God's word, he gives us other tools to reinforce and better understand what we first learn in scripture. Aesop's fables might be familiar to many of you. When I was a child, we had, a, we had volumes on our, on our bookcase that contained classics like Aesop's fables. There is one in particular that proves this point. The north wind and the sun had a quarrel about which of them was the stronger. 
While they were disputing with much heat and bluster, a traveler passed along the road wrapped in a cloak. Let us agree, said the son, that he is the strongest who can strip the traveler of his cloak. Very well, growled the north wind, and at once sent a cold howling blast against the traveler. With the first gust of wind, the ends of the cloak whipped about the traveler's body, but he immediately wrapped it closely around him, and the harder the wind blew, the tighter he held on to him, to his cloak. The north wind tore angrily at the cloak, but all his efforts were in vain. Then the sun began to shine. At first his beams were gentle, and in the pleasant warmth after the bitter cold of the north wind, the traveler unfastened his cloak and let it hang loosely from his body. The sun's rays grew warmer and warmer. The man took off his cap and mopped his brow. At last he became so heated that he pulled off his cloak and to escape the blazing sunshine threw, him down, threw himself down in the welcome shade of a tree. The moral of the fable, Aesop tells us, is this. Gentleness and kind forsakes kind persuasion win where force and bluster fail. Our God is meek and gentle. As we carve out the pillar that is gentleness, we take God's own son Jesus as the example of how to be meek. God also gives us examples in other Christians. In November of 1871, journalist Henry Stanley located the missing missionary, Dr. David Livingston, in the wilds of Africa. Stanley stayed in Africa and lived with Dr. Livingston for some time, and this is Stanley's testimony. He said, I went to Africa as prejudiced as the biggest atheist in London. But there came for me a long time for reflection. I saw this solitary man there and asked myself, why on earth does he stop here? Why on earth does he stop here? Is he cracked or what? What is it that inspires him? For months after we met, I found myself wondering at the old man carrying out all that was said in the Bible. Leave all these things and follow me. But little by little, his sympathy for others became contagious. My sympathy was aroused, seeing his piety, his gentleness, his zeal, his earnestness, and how he went about his business. I was converted by him, although he had not tried to do it. As the spirit of truth comes to us, as it did to Mr. Stanley, because of Dr. Livingston's meek and gentle ways, the spirit leads us to understand more fully beyond our limited experiences, beyond the cloudy lens through which we see, helping us to interpret God's word. The spirit leads us to the strength we need to be meek, to acquire our strength under the control of our loving God, to carve this strong pillar of gentleness as we continue to build the foundation of this house of wisdom. Let us pray. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Having heard the word of God, let us give thanks to God with our whole being. In the company of the upright, let us honor God for the blessings and goodness we have received. With gladness, let us present the offerings of our life and labor to our Lord.
things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts. With them, we offer, offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all that you have made for the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Join me as we offer our prayers of thanksgiving and concern to our Lord. We praise you, God, our Creator, for your handiwork in shaping and sustaining your wondrous creations. We thank you for the gift of life and the wonder of living. We ask particular blessings coming to us this day in the families that you give us, the friends you surround us with, the new life that we see in birth and in marriage, in baptism, in commitment to our Holy Lord. Lord, we give you thanks for positive test results, lightning loads, we thank you, Lord, for education, for students that have taken major steps this year, coming from isolation and going back into classrooms, Lord. We thank you for the educators that teach them and the administrators that have such a heavy burden of trying to keep them in the classroom. Lord, we pray for all workers in our schools. We pray for the bus drivers. We pray for the janitors. We pray for the office support staff. We pray for all of those teachers and aides. And we pray for the students, Lord, that this new world we're living in be made peaceful, that we treat each other with gentleness as we navigate these new roads. We thank you for all the resources of the earth that you give us, Lord. We pray that you be with the hunters as they're in the woods. We pray, Lord, for the help we need in keeping the resources you have given us safe. We pray, Lord, that you help us to treasure all of the gifts that you've given us on this earth. We pray for others, God our Savior, claiming your love in Jesus Christ for the whole world and committing ourselves to care for those around us in his name. Lord, we pray for those that need your comfort we pray that you make us instruments of your love, that you help us to show the peace and the gentleness that Jesus taught us. Lord, we pray for those who are persecuted in the church. We know it is such a privilege to come here unencumbered to be able to worship you openly with other Christians. Lord, we pray for those who cannot do so out of fear. We pray, Lord, that you give them your strength, that they might be meek and gentle as they lead others to your love. Lord, help us to be examples through our efforts as well as through our words. We pray, Lord, that you remind us always of how Jesus would discuss with others, would not be quarrelsome. Lord, help us to turn to your word to our ancestors in the faith, such as Paul, 
to read the instructions you give us, to delve deeper into them that we might better understand. God, our creator, yours is the morning and yours is the evening. Let Christ, the son of righteousness, shine forever in our hearts and draw us closer to your glory. Lord, we have lifted many up in prayer to you today. We pray for each of them in a special way as they travel, as they lie in the hospital waiting for a return of strength. We pray for those who face tough diagnoses, for those that will be undergoing surgery. Lord, all of these and now those that we raise to you in the silence of our hearts, we present to you through the Holy Spirit. Lord, we often don't mention those that are addicted by name, but you know them. Those that suffer from mental illness, from depression, from the effects of traumatic incidences. Lord, you know them, and you hold them close in your love. Help them to find the help that they need here through your guidance. Send your servants, send us, Lord, to be with them, not to be quarrelsome or dogmatic, but to listen, to instruct with gentleness, to grant them rest as Jesus offers us always for his Burden is light. His yoke is easy. Lord, put that yoke around those who need to follow. For those who don't know you, Lord, let them feel that gentle pull towards Christ. Lord, we ask all of this for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn today is number 591, Just a Closer Walk with Thee.
say what a difference from last week. Having a couple of strong singers in the room certainly makes a difference. We thank you for singing out. <laughs> and now, as we leave this place to serve the Lord in our own mission fields, take with you this benediction. May the grace of Christ, which daily renews us, and the love of God, which enables us to love all, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, which unites us in one body, make us eager to obey the will of God until we meet again through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.